I worked my whole life. I played by the rules. I got my credit in order. I bought the house. I put the sunroof in the sunroom in the back, and I built the pool, and I did everything I was supposed to do, and I put wood throughout the whole house. And then I tried to sell it when the market collapsed, and and I lost everything. I've, I've been discouraged, right? I've wasted my time. I've wasted strength. Um, the agony of the in vain. Right? It's, it, all that I did was in vain. All that work, all that effort, all that attempt to be a homeowner was in vain. Insecurity. The lack of any opportunity to recover and regain composure. I'll never be able to get back all the effort that I put into that house. I'll never be able to get back um, literally the money that I invested or the physical structure or the security that came along with it, right? The, um, to recover or regain composure. Being ashamed in front of oneself. This is what I said before, right? Being ashamed in front of one, oneself. How could I have been so stupid, right? Why would I have done that? I'm so discouraged that I did that. Being ashamed in front of oneself, as if one had deserved, uh, uh, deceived, sorry, as if one had deceived oneself all too long. You know, I was lying. I should have known. But I've been awakened. Never again. I'll never own another home as long as I live, right? I was deceived before. And it wasn't some spooky boogeyman of the system that deceived me. I deceived myself. Why? Because I bought into the system, right? The system sold me a bag of goods and I bought in and now I want out and I'll never go back, right? So that's what he's saying. So now I'll read it without all the explanation and it should make sense, right? Quote, so the seeker eventually becomes discouraged because of the long waste of strength, the agony of the in vain, insecurity, the lack of any opportunity to recover and regain composure, being ashamed in front of oneself as if one had deceived oneself all too long. So you recognize that there's this overbearing sense of failure, of meaninglessness, of valuelessness, of having wasted one's life in aspiration of this moral imperative. Now, before I go to read uh, Nietzsche, let me explain this, this, uh, this picture. Imagine that someone comes to me and says, you got to see what's on the other side of this mountain. You won't believe what's on the other side of this mountain. Right? And obviously, my field of view prevents me from seeing what's on the other side of the mountain. Right? But I can see the top of the mountain. Right? I have an idea of what's up here. Right? So, despite the fact that I can't see what's on the other side, I can't see the obligation, the moral, I mean, in a deontological sense, right? I can see the moral imperative, right? I, yeah, okay. Um, absolute truthfulness. Yeah, okay. That's a good thing to have. Um, absolute um, altruism. That's a good thing to have, okay? I, I can see that. I posit it as a goal for myself. And I'm going to tether myself to that moral imperative and, and sort of pull myself towards it closer and closer. Very arduous process, right? So I move from what is to what ought to be the case. And imagine that there's a point of no return. Once I cross this line, I can never go back. And in the image, what you'll see is there's a tree here, there's water, there are birds. It's supposed to be like a, like a, a great state of affairs, right? It's, you know, so I don't recognize that yet, right? So I cross this threshold, and I'm in the process of becoming, right? This is what becoming is. Becoming is this directedness, this attempt to transform, this, this, this fluidity. And I get to the top of the mountain, finally recognizing that I can't go back, recognizing that I can't go back, it's at this point, it's at this point where I have total perception. I know where I came from, and I also now get to see what's on the other side. Unfortunately, however, what's on the other side of the mountain is just despair. Right? So I drew like uh, an overpopulated urban city, a dead dead guy on the floor, smog, it's crap, it's like the grass is brown rather than green. And I think to myself, oh my god, why did I have this as a goal? Look where I just came from, and I can't go back. I can't go back, right? It's, it's lost. That, that state of affairs no longer exists, right? Here I am now, and all that's in front of me is this gloom, right? So what ends up happening is at that point I, I become nihilistic, right? Once I recognize, number three is my recognition of this state of affairs causes me, number four, to become nihilistic, right? Now, for steps, so that covers 
steps one through four. For steps five through six, we go to, uh, what did it say? Read 12a, top of 13, before I pick. 12a, top of 13. Okay. So I want to read the first, the first um, paragraph in its entirety. <laughs> given these two insights, the, uh, given these two insights, that becoming has no goal, that, remember, it, it leads to nothing. Uh, this leads to nothingness, as we said before. Given these two insights, that becoming has no goal, and that underneath all becoming, there is no grand unity in which the individual could immerse himself completely as in an element of supreme value, and escape remains. What do I do now? I'm at the top, and I realize this has all been crap. What do I do? There is an escape, and escape remains. To pass sentence on the whole world of becoming as a deception, and to invent a world beyond it as a true world. So what I do is, at this point, I recognize, oh my goodness, this has all been a myth. right? I was a sucker. I did all this work, and here I am at the apex, regretting ever having left my initial state of affairs. What do I do as my escape? As my escape, as he says, to, I pass judgment, I pass sentence on the whole world of becoming as a deception and to invent a world beyond it as a true world. So I create this, step number five, I create a world of, like, let's say, absolute peace. And I got the peace sign in the globe, right? So I create this world of absolute peace. Right? And, and I'll say that would be that would be the perfect world, like this world of absolute peace where everybody kumbaya and there's love eternal. And there's another scene again in The Matrix, I think it's The Matrix 1, where Agent Smith talks to Neo and he's like, you know, we, we, we tried to create a world in which there was absolute peace, but your minds aren't advanced enough to contemplate and to live in a state of absolute peace, right? You guys need to kill each other, so we let you kill each other. Um, but as soon as man finds out how that world is fabricated solely from psychological needs and how he has absolutely no right to it, the last form of nihilism. This is important. We recognize that there are forms of nihilism. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to take it to this level yet, but keep this in mind. And if you have your book, you should highlight or underline. The last form of nihilism, what I call ultimate nihilism, comes into being. It includes disbelief in any metaphysic, metaphysical world and forbids itself any belief in a true world. Having reached this standpoint, one grants the reality of becoming as the only reality, perpetual becoming as the only reality, forbids oneself ever kind, uh, every kind of con condestined access to afterworlds and false divinities, but cannot endure this world, though one does not want to deny it. What in the world does that mean? I arrive at this place, and I recognize how crappy it is, and thus I create a perfect world of happiness and peace and so on. But I recognize that all I've done is created this ought becomes an is, and this becomes an ought. And I recognize that once I get there, I'm going to have the same feeling. It's, it's that I'm going to go through the cycle again. So instead of doing that, I really become nihilistic. So the last step sticks is ultimate what I call ultimate nihilism. He calls it the last form of nihilism, where even the contemplation of this perfect state of affairs, theoretically, is problematic, right? I'm not even going to try for that. I'm not even going to set that as a goal. I'm not even going to aspire. I'm not going to try and um, achieve that, because I recognize that even the thought of it is problematic, right? So that becomes an ultimate, or what he calls the last form of nihilism. So, step one, I have the desire to become better. Step two, I point, I cross a point at which I can no longer go back. Step three, I recognize at the apex that my life was actually amazing. And, you know, my embodiment, my egoism, my, my imperfections as a human being is the best possible state of affairs, but I can never go back to that now that I've altered my recognition. I don't want to be part of this toxicity, so I embrace nihilism in step four. I try and contemplate a, a idyllic state of affairs only to immediately recognize that that is ultimately my undoing, and thus I embrace this ultimate nihilism where I give up on everything, and everything becomes despair um, at its sort of most, at its most grandiose, most uh, 